is next, the Bible Prophecy Seminar. I'm so glad that you all are carving out an hour each night to come and hear the Word of God. And before we start to get into our presentation, I would like you all to meet my family. This is my beautiful wife. This is Josh. He's nine years old. This is Alyssa. She is six, and they are very happy because we just got them kittens this past Saturday. And I opened the door, and I saw that kitten sleeping with my little daughter, and she had her arm around it, and the cat was just laying there sleeping. It was just, and you just take a mental picture of that so that you remember that when they're older. So we are going to have another short word of prayer because we can't pray enough. We need God's word to be uplifted. We need the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have to spend time in your word. We ask that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Now each night I'm going to tell you what's coming up, the next two presentations. And tomorrow night's topic is called... The end of the world, is it here, near, or mere fear? So we're going to talk about how soon are we near to the end of the world. And then on Wednesday at 7 p.m., we're going to ask the question, why did bad things happen to good people? If God is so good, then why is the world so full of uh, pain and suffering? That question has been asked a very, very long time. And so we're going to talk about that, which is absolutely my favorite topic out of all the subjects that we're going to be talking about. And for tonight's presentation, it is called Countdown to Eternity. You know, the past few years have been very interesting, and I'm sure that there's a lot of words that you could have used other than interesting to describe the past couple years. They've been very turbulent, haven't they? In 2020, we saw a new disease called COVID-19 as it interrupted our yearly plans and has been affecting us ever since. How many here have had COVID? Do we know anybody in here who have lost loved ones because of COVID? Yeah, I'm very sorry to hear that. I, I I know people too. I think I've had it at least twice. While we were dealing with COVID, A string of interesting social issues came up in 2020. Um, Two of them were George Floyd and Breonna Taylor killed by police, causing major social justice, riots, and, and backlash. And then, how could we forget that very turbulent and interesting election that we had a few years back? Joe Biden wins the presidency amidst a very controversial election. And unhappy with the results of the election, some took it upon themselves to storm the Capitol building. January 6th, um, the Capitol building is stormed by Trump supporters, resulting in five deaths. One was a police officer who was beaten. The other was a writer. And then there was three others who died as well. Then, in 2021, we have the resurgence of the Taliban. Biden follows through with Trump's order to remove American troops from Afghanistan no later than September 11th, 2021. And while the world was dealing with the resurgence of the Taliban, we have finally the COVID-19 vaccines arrive in 2020. In addition to that, the virus like grew friends and cousins. And then you have the mutation and we have the Delta and the variant appears then in 20. 21, you have Omicron emerging uh, emerging as a new threat. And then if that wasn't enough, we have the, the war in Ukraine, which began February 24, 2022. Russia invades Ukraine in a major escalation of the, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war that began in uh, 2014. And while we are monitoring today what is going on with the war, it is being fought right now as we speak, people around the world are still being affected by the gas prices that COVID has caused to rise. We see as we, as, yeah, arm and a leg, as we navigate through 2022, gas prices continue to pinch the wallets of Americans. Now look at this. In 2020, the average cost in August was $2.27. Now look what happened. In August 2021, it was three twenty-five. dollars Then in August 2022, which was last month, you have four oh eight is the national average. Then the other day, we hear of the loss of royalty in England. September 8th, Queen Elizabeth dies and Charles III ascends the throne. 
Friends, the winds of change are certainly blowing today, aren't they? Where can we find peace? Where can we find hope? Where can we find assurance? In a world of uncertainty, where can we find certainty? Friends, tonight, in a world of uncertainty, God's word gives us peace and hope. Can you say amen to that? But there was a time in my life where I did not have certainty. I did not have peace, and I did not have hope. I had questions about the Bible. The year was 1999, and I was a server at Olive Garden. Anybody here like to eat at Olive Garden? It's one of the only restaurants that I used to work at that I will still eat because I know it's clean because we had competitions and awards and bonuses given to the managers for the, the, the cleanest back of the house of the restaurant. So I think it's kind of safe to eat there. All right. As I was serving my guests their salad and their breadsticks, I was up in the, what we call the red zone in table 25. This is Middleburg Heights, Ohio, near Cleveland. I am from Cleveland, and that is the actual uh, restaurant. And the story that I'm telling you, this table that I'm talking you about was right behind that window about 15 feet. It was table 25, it was around, and there was, I think, a family of three or four that were sitting there, and as I was passing out their bread plates and their salad plates and putting their salad and breadsticks down, I was literally thinking to myself, does God exist? Is Satan real? Is the Bible just a history book? And what I'm going to share with you tonight is what did it for me. It solved the riddle in my mind about the Word of God. Now, do you have your, your study guide? I hope you have a pen or a pencil so that you can write the answers down. The format of this series is very simple. We're going to do a big Bible study each night. That's basically what this is. This is my sermon notes, and you have it in your hand. This is your nightly handout each night, and so this is very easy. We ask a question. We look at the answer in the Bible. You write the answer down on the line, read the note, move on to the next question. Sound simple? It's very easy. That's how we're going to do it. Now, I'm going to tell you that everything that we're going to be speaking about is from the Word of God. We want the Bible to be uplifted as man's only textbook, and that is what we believe. I believe that the Bible is the, is the inspired and errant Word of God, that is the voice of God on earth, as though we could audibly hear Him with our ears. That's where we're coming from in this series, and we at What Is Next have a firm belief that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Do you tonight? If you don't, tonight's subject is going to clear that up now question number one and i'm going right to the study guide and if you don't have a study guide you're going to need to raise your hand and then the ushers will come and pass you out a study guide question number one why does god tell us his plans in advance now a lot of times the answer the question will be uh the excuse me the bible text will be on the screen sometimes will be on the screen some of the times you'll be in your bible okay Question number one, why does God tell us his plans in advance? John 13, verse 19, Jesus says, Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come uh, to, to pass, that you may believe that I am he. Now, Jesus was, was telling his disciples that he was going to the cross, and they had expected him to be an earthly king with an earthly kingdom that would make them very high officials in his kingdom. And Jesus came for no such purpose. He came not to be... Uh, 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 to be served, but to serve, right? And be a ransom for many. And he knew that they misunderstood this. And so he said, listen, guys, guys, I want you to hear me. I am coming to be a sacrifice and not a king so that when you see that what I'm going to tell you is going to happen, you will believe and you will understand that I am the, the biblical Messiah of Bible prophecy, not the Messiah that you want, okay? Okay. So why does God tell us his plans in advance? Something I would write on the line is so that we can see that God is telling the truth and that he knows the future and, and we, can, we can be assured that he knows what's coming up next. And then the note says under question number one, fulfilled Bible prophecy verifies the truthfulness of God's word and gives us confidence that the future is in his hands. So I would write something like, God tells us so that we can believe, to inspire faith. Anything like that would be a good, would be a good answer. So far, so good? All right, question number two. Can Bible prophecy really be understood? 
Well, John tells us in the book of Revelation, which is my favorite book, amen, blessed is he, this is Revelation 1, 3, blessed is he who what? Reads and those who? The hearing in the scriptures is not only done with your ears, it's done with your heart. Did you know that? The seed of emotions for the Hebrew mind was the heart, and it is not the muscle that is inside your chest cavity, it is your mind. It is your emotions connected, okay? So blessed is he who reads and those who hear. And biblical hearing has a response where you, you um, allow the scriptures to dictate your lives and it becomes a part of you. It's not just something that you do whenever you go to church. It becomes your lifestyle. Blessed is he who read and hears the words of this prophecy and those who keep the things which are written in it. So can Bible prophecy be understood? Well, the note says, why would God promise a blessing for something that couldn't be understood? And how can you keep something that you don't understand? Because a lot of people say that Bible prophecy is very hard to, hard to understand, and Revelation has beasts and dragons and scary things in it, and I just don't want to, to dive into that because it, it gives me bad dreams at nighttime. I would like to remind you that the very first sentence in the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Are you afraid of Jesus Christ tonight? So what does the book of Revelation reveal? By the way, the root word of Revelation is reveal. And so the book of Revelation is simple history from the perspective of Jesus. He's telling us the human history that he wants us to know to be ready for his second coming, right? So we shouldn't be scared of the book of Revelation because it reveals Jesus. All right, so can Bible prophecy be understood? What would you say? Absolutely. Now, question number three. Who inspired Bible prophecy? 2 Peter 1 and verse 20. The scriptures say, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, what's a private interpretation? The prophets did not write out of their own indigestion. They wrote because they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So prophets did not come up with what they wrote on their own. By the way, what's a prophet? A prophet is simply a spokesperson for God. That's what the word prophet means in the Greek and the Hebrew. Spokesperson for God. So God gives the prophet the message. The people hear the words of the prophet, and when they hear the words of the prophet, it's not just the words of the prophet, it's the word of the Lord, okay? So knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for no prophecy ever came by the will of who? But men, spo men of God spoke as they were moved by who? The Holy Spirit. So if I was to ask you, is the Bible divine or human, what would you say? You're right, but I think you could be writer, if that's a word. Is the Bible divine or human? The answer is yes. It's both. Because holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so God worked with men of all ages, of all classes on the socioeconomic scale of all backgrounds he even used the pagan king to write one chapter in daniel chapter four nebuchadnezzar wrote daniel four and uh, it's his testimony about how he came to know the lord all right so let's let's move on to the next question question number four and we're now in the middle of our bible study question number four why doesn't bible study have the same effect on everybody okay why does the bible not have the same effect on say a secular atheist or the person who goes to church every every week why doesn't the bible affect them both the same well there's a clue in hebrews 4 verse 2 and the author of hebrews says for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them but the word which they heard did not what so they heard the word of God, but it didn't what? Profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And so a secular atheist like Richard Dawkins can read the Bible, and it is simply only a textbook. But to the person whose, whose voice has become, voice of God has become the, the feeder of their soul, 
and how they have tested God's promises and they have seen how God is faithful to them. And we're not making Christianity out to be something where if you become a Christian, nothing ever bad happens in your life. That's just simply not reality. When a puppy gets ran over, we just don't simply say, praise the Lord, right? We live in a world where bad things happen to good people. We live in a world where we go up and down in our spiritual experience. But friends, ultimately, the word of God is our anchor. And when we go through ups and downs in our religious experience, it is the word which connects us to the anchor of God, which never, ever, ever changes. Amen? So, why doesn't everybody be, be affected the same by the scriptures? Because some hear it with, with uh, doubts and, and just curiosity, and some actually believe and apply the promises of the word of God to their life. And those are the people who become converted. So the note says, to number four, a key ingredient to correctly apply and understand um, the Bible is faith. If you believe that, let me hear you say amen. Now, who alone, question number five, can tell us the future? Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. This is a, this is a very fun verse for me because um, I used to work at a, at a school of evangelism called Mission College of Evangelism in Portland, Oregon. And a, uh, the campus was being sold to a, a group called Ananda. And the leader, the cult leader, his name was the Diva, Right? and which is short for divine. And they took all the dog walking signs off because if, you, if you're meditating or something and you, you hear a dog bark, it might tug on your vibe and you might not levitate or float around the room or whatever they were trying to do. And uh, I, I knew that the cult leader's name was the diva, and so I wrote this verse on, on, the, on the big chalkboard in the science building where they would have their main meetings. I am God, there is no other. And then I, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I wrote a bunch of texts, you know, to, to kind of like poke them a little bit, saying that Jesus is God, not the diva. Amen. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. And I am God, and there was none like me. Some people have claimed to be God, but what makes God different from them? Well, here's the answer. He declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Only God knows the future. Did you know that 33% of the Bible is predictive prophecy? And the writings of Buddha and uh, Confucius and Muhammad are lacking in prophecy. The reason why is they don't know. Only God knows the future. And that is why we believe in Scripture, because fulfilled Bible pro prophecy verifies the truthfulness of of God's word. Can you say amen to that tonight? Now, let's get into the main body of our message for this evening. Question number six. You're going to need to turn to your Bibles to Daniel chapter two. Go to your Bible in the Old Testament and what's called the minor prophets. Minor because they're small, not because they're minor important. Minorly important. Um, go to Daniel chapter two. And verse 1. Now, why are we talking about the king whose name is Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar. Can you say that with me? Nebuchadnezzar. You might name your next cat that. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar. The king of Babylon at this point where Daniel, our friend, who was captive um, from, the, from the, the captivity from uh, 586 B.C., carried from Judah all the way to, to Babylon, and Israel and Judah were bad boys, and God was trying to help, it, help Judah become more spiritual by paddling them, and that paddle was named King Nebuchadnezzar, and he was spanking the behind of his children by allowing them to show them how good they had it to carry away captive lots of people from Judah all the way into Babylon. And they were only supposed to be there for 70 years, according to the prophet uh, Jeremiah. But we see in Babylon that there was a lot of interesting things. Babylon is known for the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which is one of the eight wonders of the world. Babylon was a, a giant square, and it had the river Euphrates that flew, uh, flowed right through the center. I mean, if you live in a desert, you kind of need water, right? So they were smart enough to build 
their city around the Euphrates River, which was a very large river. And the city on the bottom, the walls were 60 feet wide at the bottom, and then they bowed in to 50 feet on the top. And the chariot, uh, the, the, the walls were so wide that they could have chariot races, three chariots wide. And so Babylon was a major, major power. In fact, it was the world power at this time in 586 B.C., around that time where our story takes place. Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or, um, or uh, you, you might know them as, uh, uh, as a, uh, what are their three names? Their names are escaping me because it's not that in, in relative to our story. I'll get it in a second. All right, so the, Daniel and his three friends were carried away captive to, to Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He had a dream that was very important. In fact, it wasn't just a dream once. He dreamed it several times. So if you're there in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1, are you there? Daniel 2 verse 1 says, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Notice it said he had dreams, plural. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the, so the soothsayers, the, and all of the other psychics, the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now, in the Babylonian culture, when the gods would speak to the king, it would be considered very disrespectful to the gods to forget the dream. And so when you made the gods angry, famines and war and plagues break out. And so Nebuchadnezzar was feeling very anxious to keep his kingdom running smoothly that he forgot this dream and he was so afraid he was going to upset the gods. That's why he wanted to know this dream uh, very well. And so he called all of his, his astrologers and soothsayers and, and psychics in to tell him his dream. Okay, And they were not able to tell him his dream because, because there is only one who can tell what goes on in, in the mind. Okay, so why was King Nebuchadnezzar so troubled? What would you write on the line? Because he forgot a dream and he, he wanted to remember it. Okay, I already set all the information in the note for six, so we are going to go right on to number seven. Now, Daniel and his three friends... They were in real trouble. And in Daniel 2 and verse 17, we pick it up. What happens? So Daniel and his three friends had distinguished themselves, and they had become what were, what were called the wise men of Babylon. They went to Babylon University, and they passed all their oral exams, and they graduated in the upper top half of the class. And so they were put to work in the king's, in the king's realm. So in Daniel 2... In verse 17, the scripture says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to, there it is, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I've known those three names from a kid. I just couldn't remember it at that second. Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, his companions. Why? That they might seek the mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the, of the wise men of Babylon. And so the command had, had gone out to start to kill the wise men of Babylon because they couldn't tell the king his dream, and Daniel gets a knock on the door from Arioch, the captain of the king's guards, and he says, Daniel, I'm sorry, it's time to die. And Daniel says, whoa, what's going on? Why is the king's decree so urgent? And so he tells the whole thing. King had a dream. He wants to know his dream. He wants to have the, the wise men tell the dream. They couldn't tell the dream. And the king said, you have to die. And so now it's time to die. And then Daniel says, give me time that I might seek the mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. And that is exactly what happened. Friends, when you're in trouble, instinctively as Christians, the first thing that you should do is what? Pray. Now, do you only wait until you're in trouble to pray? You should pray when good things happen. You should pray 
when it's sunny outside. You should pray when it's rainy outside. You should pray when it's good, when it's bad, all the time. Thank the Lord and stay connected through prayer. So when Daniel and his friends were in trouble, they called upon God and he answered their prayers. So what would you write? What did Daniel and his friends do when they were in trouble? They prayed. So if God answered their prayers, then what do you need to do when you're in trouble? You need to pray, right? Now, what did Nebuchadnezzar see in his dream? Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep one night, and he dreamed of a giant metal man. And here's what it said. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze or brass, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, which is a reference to God making it, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff, which is like dust, from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain, and it filled the whole earth. That is Daniel 2, 31 through 35. So what did Nebuchadnezzar see in his dream? I would write something like a giant metal image. Okay? Anything like that, you're probably safe. Question number nine. What did the head of gold represent? Now, we're not just going to take a, a, a pole. We're just not going to, you know, shoot at a cloud and hopefully we hit a duck. Bible prophecy does not guess. Bible prophecy knows, okay? God gave the dream, and he's going to reveal what the dream means. And basically, this dream is simply a five-step timeline from Daniel's time all the way up to the end of the world at the second coming of Jesus, Question number nine, what did the head of gold represent? Daniel 2, 37 and 38. So you have your Bible open to Daniel 2. Let's read Daniel 2, 37 and 38. Daniel 2, 37 and 38. Are you there? Daniel 2, 37 says, You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom power and, and uh, great riches and, and glory. And so, Nebuchadnezzar, you haven't achieved the status that you have because you were so great. I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, there's a power. There's a power higher than you that you need to acknowledge, and that, pow that power, his name is God. And then it says in verse 38, And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the fields, and the birds of the heavens, he has given them into your hand. And so Daniel is going out of his way to make sure that Nebuchadnezzar knows that he is under God and that God is a power higher than him. Because, of course, he thought that he was the highest power in, in the land. And then it says, He has given them into your hand, and he has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Okay? So Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of which kingdom again? Babylon. You're going to be all historians at the end of this message. You're going to be able to rip off world history just like that. So Nebuchadnezzar was the king of who? Babylon. Okay. So Babylon represents this head of gold with Nebuchadnezzar as its, its first king. Okay? So the note for nine says the head of gold represents the kingdom of Babylon the dream is basically a timeline of world empires that would affect God's people un until the time of the second coming of Jesus. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is the foundational prophecy for most of end-time Bible prophecy. And historically speaking, and you can Google every bit of this, this is historical facts. Babylon ruled from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. Okay, so the head of gold represents who? Babylon. Okay, you're doing well. Let's go to question number 10. What nation would arise after Babylon? Daniel 2 and verse 39. Daniel 2 and verse 39. 
But after you shall arise another kingdom. I bet Nebuchadnezzar liked this. I'm sure as soon as he started talking about this metal man, everything that was in his dream came back, and he was connected to Daniel. And he's like, yes, that's exactly what I saw. This kid knows exactly what I saw. How does he know this? Because he's connected to the Lord, that's how. Because he prays, and he studies, and he reads his Bible. And then I think he liked everything until verse 39. Verse 39 says, but after you. What do you mean after me? Right? Right? But after you shall another kingdom, another kingdom, yes, Nebuchadnezzar, another kingdom shall rise inferior. Inferior? Another king that's inferior? And a kingdom that's inferior is coming up after me? Now, you need to understand how much faith it took for Daniel to relay this part. We're doing great from 38 to 30, you know, 37 and 38. But it took a lot of courage and a lot of faith in in the Lord to relate this part because King Nebuchadnezzar had sent Ariok to Daniel to kill him. And if the Holy Spirit wasn't making a connection with Daniel, his life was on the line the second time. So I don't want you to miss that point. See, Bible prophecy is not just about knowing who the Antichrist or what the mark of the beast is. Because I got news for you. If there was no Jesus Christ, there would be no Antichrist. Amen? Amen. So a lot of people want to know about the mark of the beast and the Antichrist, but the purpose of Bible prophecy is to grasp our hearts. It's to connect us to the God of heaven so that we could have Daniel's God, just not Daniel's knowledge. Amen? So in Daniel 2, verse 39, let me finish the verse. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Now, Which nation, according to the book of Daniel, overtook Babylon? See, Bible prophecy doesn't guess, it knows. It tells us. God walks us right through this this stream. Okay, take your Bible and go to Daniel chapter 5. Have you ever heard the phrase, can't you read the handwriting on the wall? That comes from Daniel chapter 5, okay? Daniel chapter 5. Your mother's been telling you that your whole life, and she got that wisdom right from the scriptures. Daniel 5 and verse 24. Nebuchadnezzar had died, and his grandson, Belshazzar, throws a party. That's Belshazzar's claim to fame in scripture. That's what the Bible says about him. He threw a party. That's That's what the scripture records of Belshazzar the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. That's all the scriptures say about him is that he threw a party. And so what happened was when Babylon attacked Judah, they decided to go into the sanctuary, the church, which is their main place of worship, and carry away captive some of the vessels that the Hebrews used to worship their God and put it in the temple of Marduk, which was, which was Babylon's main god. You see, in those days, when two armies went to war, it was assumed by the armies that whose god was stronger, that is who would get the victory. So according to Babylon, Marduk was stronger than Jehovah. And so to thumb their nose at God to worship Marduk, making Jehovah inferior, they decided that it would be a good idea to go get those cups and drink alcoholic wine and the vessels of the Lord and toast to the gods of Babylon. And God was like, no, you didn't. Okay? And so right about that time, they started to drink and toast to their gods. A giant hand wrote on the wall, meanie, meanie, tekel, you farsen. And then it says that that Belshazzar's loins were loose and his knees knocked together because he was that scared, okay? And so not so tough now, are we? What does it mean, meeny, meeny, tekel, you farsen? Daniel chapter 5 and verse 24. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and the writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written, meeny, meeny, tekel, you farsen. And so they call all the astrologers in, they call everybody, but then they couldn't tell the king the interpretation. And then the queen mother was smart enough to say, go get Daniel. He helped your granddad, 
and, and way back in, in chapter 2, right? And so Daniel's brought in, and he looks at it, and the Spirit said this. Go to verse 26. This is the inscription of each word, meaning, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, which sounds a lot like Persia, your kingdom has been divided and been given to the Medes and the Persians. And so that is exactly what happened. October 13, 539 B.C., the Medes and the Persians had Babylon surrounded that very night when, Nebuch- when uh, Belshazzar threw that, that party. I mean, history books tell us that the Babylonian army was so arrogant that they were having a festival that night, and they had meat that they were eating, and they took meat, and they threw it down to the medio persian soldiers. Hey, you look hungry down there. We're doing just fine, because they had, they had the water, they had the gates, they had the big walls, and they thought that they were fine. And see, what happened was, this cylinder, which was found in 1879 by Hormad Rassam, it's, it's in a, uh, a British museum. It tells the battle plans that, that Cyrus, which was the king of the Persians, the Persians teamed up with the, the Medes, which they had Darius or Darius, depending on how you say it and where you're from in the world. Um, they, they both teamed up, and they diverted the Euphrates River and sent their soldiers under the wall and opened those double doors. And that night, a Persian boot kicked open that door, And that very night, Belshazzar was slain, and and Daniel survived the violent exchange of power. And if you could read this language, which is ancient cuneiform, you would be able to read the battle plans that, that Cyrus made to divert the river and to attack Babylon. Friends, there has not been one archaeological discovery that has ever proved that the Bible is not accurate. I have two presentations on on biblical archaeology that maybe I'll give you sometime. And friends, there is a ridiculous amount of evidence of the Bible's historicity. And the important thing about biblical archaeology is if you could accept the Bible historically, then you could accept it spiritually. Amen? Because if you can't trust the historicity of Scripture, then how can you accept the God the Bible presents? Amen? All right. So if you also... In your, in your note, we're not going to look it up tonight, but Isaiah 44, 28 through 45 actually talks about the general Cyrus, the king of the Persians, about 200 years before he was even born. He calls him his anointed, my shepherd, whose right hand I have held to subdue kings and, and to loose the, the armor of, uh, of kings and to open the, the double doors of, of Babylon. And so God even knew Um, that Cyrus was going to overthrow Babylon even before he was even born, okay? And so the chest and arms of silver represent which nations? The Medes and the Persians. So what's the head of gold? Babylon. And then the next is? Medes and the Persians. Babylon, Medo-Persia, okay? And then uh, the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, later became known as Persia, and that's when you have the story of Queen Esther. That, was, that, took, that takes place during what's called the Persian Empire, which lasted until 331 at the Battle of Arabella. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, which nation would overthrow Persia? Remember in 239 of Daniel, it says another kingdom inferior the belly and thighs of, of brass, the third section on, on the statue. To find out who the belly and thighs of brass is, let's go to Daniel chapter 8, where Daniel has a vision, and God walks us very nicely right through this, this part of uh, the prophecy. Daniel has a vision this time, not Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is gone. Belshazzar is even gone at that point. Daniel has a, a, a vision In 8, verse 2, I'll summarize, and then we'll go to the interpretation. So it's right there, and you check me out, make sure I'm telling you what's true. Daniel has a a vision of of 
a ram with two horns, but one horn was higher. Then there was a goat with a notable horn, and the goat attacks the ram, breaks his two horns, kills the goat. Okay? And so that's Daniel's vision that he sees. Now we move from explanation to interpretation in verses 20 and 21. The angel Gabriel shows up and tells Daniel exactly who the ram and the goat are verbatim. Okay, you ready? Daniel 8, 20 and 21. Gabriel speaking the angel from God. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of who? Media and Persia. Then the notable goat, the male goat, is the kingdom of who? Grecia, Greece. And so we see that the belly and thighs of brass represent Greece who overtook Persia. So the head of gold is who? Babylon. The chest and arms of silver is? And then the belly and thighs of brass is? Greece. So Babylon, Persia, Greece. Can you say that with me? Babylon, Persia, Greece. See how good you guys are doing? All right, let's move right, right along. So Persia ruled, Persia ruled um, from 539 to 331, and then Greece ruled from 331 to 168 BC. I wonder, question number 12, which nation overtakes Greece? Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Let's go back to Daniel 2 and go to verse 40. Daniel 2 and verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as what? Iron. In your knowledge of history and all of your hours that you have spent watching the History Channel, which nation is called the Iron Empire? Rome. Okay? Now, there's no text in Scripture that I can take you that says Rome is the fourth world empire. However, it's inferred very strongly by all the four Gospels. How do we know? Well, what kind of whip was Jesus beaten with when he was, cru- when he was uh, beaten? Roman. What kind of cross was he crucified on? Who was the world empire at the time of, of uh, Jesus? Rome. Because somewhere around, I believe it was 164 B.C., Palestine became a Roman province, which means that all of the world at that point was underneath Rome. And that's why you see the tension between the Jews and the Romans and the tax thing and the Roman soldiers and the we have no king but Caesar thing at the, at the, the crucifixion and trial of Jesus. So Rome was the world empire at the time of Jesus, okay? And Rome lasted all the way up to 476 A.D. when Western Rome fell. Okay? And so if you look at the note under number 12, what nation would overtake Greece? What was that, everybody? Rome. Okay, the note for number 12 says, The Battle of Pydna, June 22nd, 168 B.C., marked the final destruction of the Grecian Empire. Historian Edward Gibbon writes in his big, big, thick volume of history, the images of gold, of silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. And this is, did you see how the historian used the language of Daniel too? All the kingdom, all the, the, the minerals, the metals? That's from the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, chapter 38, page 651 and 652. So Rome was in power during the, the time of Jesus, and it ruled the world until 476 A.D. Now, moving right along, question number 13. What did the feet of iron and clay symbolize? Daniel 2, 41 and 42. Daniel 2, 41 and 42. Are you there? All right. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of iron shall be in it. Just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, 
but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. Now, what in the world does that mean? So notice that the legs of iron, the power of the Roman Empire, would come all the way down into the feet. Only it was mixed with clay. Now notice how the prophecy goes. It does not go gold, silver, brass, iron, copper, tin, zinc. It goes gold, silver, brass, iron, clay. The molecular properties of clay and iron do not mix, right? How long would it take before you put clay in a, and iron in a bucket, mix it together until you get clyrin? It doesn't work. They would never, because they just don't adhere to one another. So the strength of the Iron Empire of Rome would go down for some time into the next kingdom, but this was one kingdom, and all the other metal sections, which represented um, Babylon, Persia, and Greece, they were all one, one nation. But this one is not one. This one has ten toes or ten divisions. It is not, u- it is not united, but divided. And so the next section represents the the ten divisions that Rome fell in in 476 A.D. Rome was not conquered. It divided because of internal conflict. They did not separate because of a war. They separated because they just lost strength. Okay, They separated into the ten divisions of Rome. They are as, fo- as follows. When they first started, now it's like 230-something countries over there, or a little more than that even. Number one, the Anglo-Saxons became England, over there where Robin Hood lives. The Franks became the French, the Alemanni became Germany, the Lombards became um, I- Italy, and then the Ostrogoths, they became extinct. The Burgundians made watches, they became the Swiss, the Sueve became Portugal, the Visigoths became Spain, the Vandals, which is where we get our term vandalism from, um, they became extinct, and then the Heraliae, they also later on became extinct, and those three, those three people groups we're going to talk about in future nights. Now, if you have lots of money, and you have the opportunity to take a trip to Denmark, remember how the, the, the text said, they will mingle their seed with the seed of men, but they will not cleave to another? What that means, how that bore out in history, the kings and queens of Europe tried to intermarry and unite. They thought that they would keep Europe strong, and unfortunately the plan backfired because a lot of the wars were family spats of Europe. So if you come to Luxembourg Castle in Denmark and you walk right in the, the door, here is a family tree of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. And you can see how they tried to intermarry, but it just did not work. Okay? So tonight, God's word is sure. Okay, flip over to, you should be on the back. Now, question 14. What prevents political leaders from uniting in Europe? Daniel 2, verse 43. It said, as as we read, As you saw, iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle the seed with, with men of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with ceramic clay. That one text, friends, that one text prevented men like Charles V, Napoleon, Adolf Hitler, Kaiser Wilhelm, and other people who have tried to take over and unite Europe. They are still trying to do it. But one text of Scripture, Daniel 2.43, says that Hitler could not win World War II, even with all the power that he had. So let me ask you a question. What does the head of gold represent? And then the chest and arms of silver. And then the belly and thighs of brass. Greece, the legs of iron represent Rome. And then the feet of iron and clay represent divided Europe. Okay, so say it with me. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe. Okay, say it with me. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe. Just like that. Okay? So now you're all... Accomplished historians. See how smart you are? Put that on the fridge, everybody. 
Okay, so at what point on the statue are we all living? Do we live during Babylon? Do we live during Rome? We're in the toenails. Some scholars said we are in the toenails of time. That lets you know that this world is not just going to keep going. We are moving towards the end of this dream, and there's one piece of unfinished business. Question 15. What does the rock which struck the feet represent? Daniel 2 and verse 44. The Bible says in Daniel 2 and verse 44, And in the days of these kings, which kings? Kings of Babylon? Kings of Rome? No, it says the kings of divided Europe. The days of these times, the times of Charles III, right? In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. All the other ones were destroyed. God's kingdom will not, right? And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Okay, so now we need to figure out what event marks the beginning of God's everlasting kingdom. Now, in a kingdom, a king sits on a throne, your Bible says in Matthew 25 and verse 31, when the Son of Man does what? When he what? When he what? When he comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. That is a very important word in that sentence as, per, as it pertains to our study tonight. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You see, that's how we understand the Bible. One text explains another. The scriptures in Daniel does not say what the rock represents, but when you go elsewhere in scripture, it represents the rock of ages coming to destroy the kingdoms of this world and give his kingdom to his people. Can you say amen to that? Now, what did Daniel say about the, the, the dream? We're on question number 17, wrapping up. What did Daniel say about the interpretation of this dream? Daniel 2 and verse 45, the text says, Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it was broken pieces of iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. Then the next words are just strong. They're powerful. Then the dream is certain, and the dream is what? Sure. You know why? Because the God who gave the dream is certain, and he is sure. Can you say amen? So, friends, tonight we can see that the Bible is historically accurate. Can you agree with that tonight? That is very important because when we receive the Bible as the word of the Lord, then we are able to receive the Lord of the word, and that's Jesus Christ. I read a book one time called A Thousand Shall Fall, and this is a story about a man who was a Christian who was drafted into Nazi Germany, and I think they should make a movie out of this. It would be fabulous. Um, here is a conversation that Franz Hazel had with his captain when he was deep in Russian territory. Pick it up, page 121. Now, Hazel was a Christian, and he knew Daniel too very well, okay? He understood that he was fighting a war that he could not win because of Daniel 2, verse 43, they shall not cleave. He understood that he was risking his life just to obey orders, praying that God would spare his life. Okay, so here's what happened. Hazel took it upon himself to explain to his captain that they were fighting a war that they could not win, okay? The captain took his hat off because you know that there were lots of men in Hitler's army that weren't exactly supportive of him. Most weren't, but there were, there were several. Because of the movie Valkyrie, we understand that there were several attempts to assassinate Hitler. And people were interested in living, not necessarily only following the orders of the Fuhrer. So when they took off their hat and put it on the desk, 
that meant that they were speaking unofficially, right? And so the captain took off his hat and put it on the desk, and that made Hazel breathe a little easier. And then he, he taught him Daniel too. He told him the whole thing. We can't win this war. God said they shall not cleave together. Hitler cannot win. And he said, is that all? And he said, that is all. The captain put his hat back on, and he said, you are dismissed. Okay, the next morning, Hazel was, was brought back the second time, and the captain asked Hazel to leave his Bible there so that they can study it. And what Hazel didn't know, another man in his battalion was a historian before he was a soldier. And he, he told the, the, this historian soldier everything that Hazel had just told him, and he said, Hazel's right. Okay? But Hazel, Franz Hazel didn't know all this. And so what happened the next morning, Hazel came back, and there was a really tall commander, and Hazel thought he was Sizzle Fitz, right? You understand what that means. He thought he was dead because they have a little trial, and then they take you out back and shoot you in the head and then throw you in a ditch. That's how they did it back then. Here, here we have it. Hazel he said, I appreciate what you shared with me. He looked around and lowered his voice. From now on, we will no longer operate a third of our motor vehicles. He said, the gasoline rations thus saved, I want you to store in drums and, when, and canisters so that when the end comes, we will have enough fuel to get home. And Hazel responded, yes, sir, and walked right out, praising God that he was not going to be killed like Daniel. Right? So he, Franz Hazel knew Daniel too. And it literally saved his life. And I'm telling you that Daniel, too, saved my life because I was wild. I was aimless. I had an awful relationship with my father and I had no goals. I had no aspirations. And this prophecy is what gave me stability because I realized that the Bible is not just a book. It's the word of God. And it became the voice of, of, of my soul. And I hope it becomes the voice of God to your soul. So at the very beginning, I'm sorry, at the very end, it says, my choice, recognizing that God is in full control of the future. Do you want to be a part of his kingdom that will last forever? And I invite you to check that box and we will close tonight's message on time because we only want to keep you about an hour each night. We don't want you to make you think that you're going to be here all night. We respect your time, and we're going to close on time each night. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've had to spend in your word, hearing new things, studying new things, and seeing how Bible prophecy verifies the truthfulness of your word. Thank you, Lord, for talking to us tonight, and make us ready to be in that kingdom which will never be destroyed. In Jesus' name, we all can say, Amen. Now, thank you for coming tonight. Tomorrow night, we're going to have the presentation, The End of the World, Is It Here, Near, or Mere Fear? Bring your friends, bring your enemy, but don't bring a pet. Amen? Yes. You are dismissed, and I understand that we have some food in, in the uh, fellowship hall, so...